Hello again, I'm Andrea Gonzalez with Trellis Strategies. Thank you for joining us today. We're in our third Trellis Strategies 360 discussion series. And in this series, we are discussing the modern learner and the multiple personas and commitments they navigate. Today's discussion is our fourth and final in this series on the modern learner. And we will be specifically discussing time, poverty, and the impact on the student experience. Our discussion will be led by our president and CEO, Dr. Deborah Cromie. And as the filing in has leveled off of it, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Deborah. Great, thank you, Andrea. And thank you for all your work behind the scenes to organize and, and get us ready for what I think is gonna be a fabulous conversation. So appreciate everyone being with us today. Um, and uh, if this is your first time, welcome. If you're back again, so pleased to have you. So I'm going to start off with a few introductions. As Andrea mentioned, I am President and CEO at Trellis. Uh, we've been hosting these for a couple of years now, and i um, really excited to jump into this particular topic on time poverty and the impact on the student experience. So let me start with some introductions. I'm really pleased to have with us here today, uh, Dr. Linda Garza Battles. Um, uh, Dr. Battles is the Regional Vice President at Western Governors University for the South Region. Dr. Battles has 28 years of experience in higher education, um, specifically strategic planning, policy development, and stakeholder engagement, and really pleased to have you with us today, Linda. Uh, next up is Dr. Jennifer Turner. Um, Dr. Turner is Senior Research Associate, Associate at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Dr. Turner's research focuses on advancing equity for student parents, especially single mothers, with an expertise in intersectional qualitative research design and methodology. Again, really pleased to have you with us today, Jennifer. Uh, and next up is Dr. Claire Willadis. Um, Dr. Willadis is professor of mathematics at Borough of Manhattan Community College, um, also known as uh, at CUNY. Dr. Willadis is director of the CUNY Equity Through Education Research Group. Dr. Willadis' research focuses on higher education, um, math and mathematics education, particularly on issues of access and retention for non-traditional students. Those are the ones we call modern learners. Um, or students who have traditionally been underrepresented or underrepresented, up, underrepresented or underserved in college and in STEM fields. So we have a great lineup of panelists today and I'm excited to jump in. But I'm gonna start with just a quick definition um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term time poverty. Um, it's just what it sounds like. It's the lack of sufficient time to pursue a particular interest or engage in specific activities. Uh, in this case, we are referring to students who do not have enough time for their studies and there are, uh, myriad reasons why that's the, ca the case. And today we're gonna discuss those myriad situations that lead to time poverty for today's students, these modern learners who have so many other things going on in their life and explore potential mitigations to address those challenges and hoping to hear from Dr. Battles about some things that are actually happening on her campuses um, that are addressing those issues. So I'm gonna start um, and share uh, an excerpt from the Trellis Strategies uh, research entitled Financial Insecurity and Time Poverty Among Modern Learners. It's a brief we put out, and I think Andrea is going to drop the link to that into the chat box. But let me just share this little excerpt for you. M with you, much, uh, much higher percentages of modern learners are parents, and higher percentages report financially supporting children, spouses, parents, or other family members. 70% of students aged 25 and older said it was important that they financially support their family while in college, compared to just 34% of those um, who are younger students or what we would consider the more traditional students. Nearly three quarters of modern learners reported working while enrolled. Three quarters um, of that, what did I say, 60, um, uh, 70%. Um, and they're working 40, 63% of them are working 40 hours or more per week. They're balancing school, work, and family. And that can be very challenging and can sometimes mean placing school at a lower priority. And here's where we're getting to the issue of time poverty. A majority of students aged 25 and older, 62%, think of themselves as workers who go to school. Think about that for a minute. 
workers who go to school, not students who work, um, which is really, um, I think, something that has been evolving and changing over time. And I, I expect that this will continue to increase. So 62% think of themselves as workers who go to school rather than students who work. Conversely, only about 24% of younger students put themselves in that same category um, of thinking of themselves as workers first. So when the student persona is a lower priority or that piece of balancing all those pieces and puts being a student lower, it may be more difficult to focus on academics and persist to graduation. So this is a particular group of students, um, and I'm not gonna just say group, it sounds like the majority of our students are facing this issue around time poverty. And in our prep, um, uh, we were talking a little bit about the fact that this is an issue which just does not get as, enough attention um, and certainly not the attention it deserves to really help students uh, move through this process and be successful in whatever program of post-secondary ed they choose to move forward with. Um, I'm also going to share that a majority of undergraduate respondents to our fall 2023 student financial wellness survey, um, uh, and Andrea is going to put that uh, in the in the um, chat as well. I'll link to that for those of you who haven't seen it yet. As I mentioned, 68% re report um, that they are working for pay while enrolled in college. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a huge change from you know the traditional 18 to 22 um, year old student, which I think is a misnomer because I don't think they're traditional anymore. They're traditional of years gone by, right? Um, and so when we think about first generation students, parenting students, learners who identify primarily as workers, um, all importance, uh, all for the importance of supporting their families while enrolled in college. This is a population we need to focus on. So I'm going to open this up, um, and I'm going to ask Claire to start off um, and respond to um, this um, post-secondary student persona that has evolved into a modern learner and what pressures they're facing. But I'd love for you to comment on some of your research um, that aligns or perhaps is different from what we're seeing from our perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, so we've done a lot of research specifically looking at um, quantitatively trying to measure students' time poverty as a holistic thing, um, and also qualitatively trying to find out more about students' experiences of it. And, and that's revealed a lot of important um, patterns, I feel. So the, the first pattern is just that of the student population we studied, which is the City University of New York. So it's a large public university in New York City with a very diverse um, set of students is that the vast majority of students are under some amount of time poverty pressure. If you actually look at the average amount of time students are spending, if you add up time just on uh, childcare, uh, paid work, um, housework, and then, and then the time they spend in their studies, we're often looking at an average that's like the equivalent of close to two full-time jobs right there. You know, something that's 60 some odd hours per week. And so that's just a typical student. And that's not even looking for some of these extreme differences that individual students may experience. Um, and if you look at students' narratives, I think it often reveals how this experience of time poverty is more nuanced and cumulative. So it's not just having one, one extra thing to do outside of school. I think for a lot of these students, it's like a network of things that are independent and build on one another. So for example, they may have kids. Because they have kids, they have to spend time on childcare, but they also have to work because they have to pay for their living expenses. So that adds more time that they can't spend on school. Then perhaps the pressures of all of that added uh, time pressures that they have for their paid and unpaid work outside of school and their schoolwork mean that leads to stress. It can lead to health issues. And then those health issues themselves can contribute to further time poverty. And so when you hear a lot of the narratives of these students, you see how it's really this cumulative effect um, that can happen when students have, um, have insufficient time for their studies. Um, I think another important pattern that we found is that a lot of this time poverty is is not really a choice for students. It's often born out of structural issues, out of financial necessity. Um, we often ask students on our surveys, if you could afford to work less, would you, would you do so? Would you take more classes? Would you prefer to have more childcare? These sorts of questions. And the vast majority of them answer yes to those questions. They say, oh yes, I would love to have more time for school if I had more financial aid or if I didn't have to work or if I had more access to childcare. So I think this points to how much of this time poverty is really a systemic structural issue for a lot of students and that that's really important to recognize. Um, and so I think what we really see in our research is that 
really looking at systemic solutions that can think about how we can better resource these students and also adapt existing educational structures to these students is probably really important because we need to look at the realities of their lives and try to figure out how we can best support them given all of these competing time demands that they have. Right. Thank you for sharing your research um, and what you've seen specifically from the work that you've done with the City University of New York. I want to turn now to Dr. Turner because I know you focus specifically on single moms and um, want to hear what you're seeing as well. And again, where that might align with what we've heard from Claire or where you may have some other, you know, nuanced um, findings that you might want to share with us. Yeah, I was just going to echo something that Claire said. Um, specifically about the structural issues, mainly financial necessity. That's something that we found was a huge barrier in our research. Um, we already know that's for student mothers, a lack of financial resources is a huge barrier to them not necessarily pursuing or completing their educational goals. But for black single mother students, which my research focuses on, um, this is even more so the case. And so we did a qualitative study about a year ago of 25 black single mother community college students. And we found that this was a huge <clears throat> barrier. And we also know that black student parents um, tend to carry more student debt than other student parents, although student parents generally have more student debt than non-student parents. And so um, that's another way that this is a structural issue. Um, one of the ways in which policymakers could really help this issue, for example, would be you know, student debt relief. Um, and so we know that, um, so that that's a big part of this as well. So the pressures, especially for single mother students are definitely compounded by the fact that they are single. They don't necessarily have that other, that additional financial support from a partner or from family members. In some cases they do, oftentimes they don't. And so it really becomes a basic needs conversation as well. Um, one of the ways that institutions can alleviate this issue would be to provide basic need support, work with the state and local governments to, or even the federal government, to provide basic need support for housing and transportation and um, tuition and so forth. And so, um, so yeah, it's definitely a multi-layered structural issue, as Dr. Claire said. Great, thank you so much. I'm now gonna to turn to um, Linda, who um, I know WGU has been for many years trying to address these structural issues that, um, that we just spoke about. So I'll turn it over to you, Linda. Well, that is such a perfect uh, cue for our setup for me to talk about Western Governors University because it is those two reasons, time and cost barriers, are exactly why 19 governors of the Western states created WGU uh, as a nonprofit online university. We were established back in 1997 to provide that flexibility, that affordability to high quality bachelor's and master's degrees um, that really align to workforce needs. Um, we really were the first accredited competency-based university in the nation. And we're still the only university providing competency-based education at scale. So just to give you an idea of our scalability, we serve today over 176,000 students nationwide and have awarded over 391,000 degrees to more than 348,000 graduates in all of the 50 states. So just to give you an idea of the profile of our students. 74% uh, of WGU students come from one or more underserved populations. This includes 43% who are first generation, 33% who are from historically underrepresented uh, races and ethnicities, 21% are low income, and 17% are rural. Now, 79% of our students are enrolled full time or most of our students are enrolled full time, but 79% also work. Uh, so that is amazing uh, that they're able to do both. And the reason that they can do both is because of the way that they learn. Uh, so online through asynchronous courses, they can take their, cor their coursework uh, at their own time, at their own pace. So students who come with us typically are, uh, the medium age is about 33. And so they come with already uh, 
prior knowledge and skills and abilities that they can use in the coursework to accelerate and then slow down in areas where they they need to focus. Um, but it's 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 essentially we have we have tried to address the affordability issue for uh, these underrepresented in, uh, students. We know that 44.3 million adults in the U.S. hold 1.7 trillion dollars in student debt. So, um, uh, Dr. Turner t talked earlier about uh, the the student debt issue. What we've done at WGU is we first of all try to keep costs low, um, and we our tuition model charges students a flat rate tuition per six month term. So students are able to take as many courses as they can master under that same tuition rate. Uh, so again, potentially saving time and money. Uh, in terms of the student loan debt uh, crisis, we back in 2013 instigated, instituted what we called the WGU's Responsible Borrowing Initiative. And this focuses uh, on helping students really understand um, student loans and encouraging them to borrow only what they need. Uh, so since 2013, the average borrower per year per student of those who borrow has decreased by more than 30 percent. Um, and so we believe that knowledge is power. You know, when students make informed decisions, they tend to do that. And so in 2023, for example, uh, we saw that 53% 53 of our undergraduate students borrowed uh, for school, which is about the same as the national average, which is about 54%. But the average debt at graduation for WGU undergraduate students who borrowed is 15,557. And that is half of the debt of the of their peers across the nation. Uh, so we're we're trying to do to balance that as well. Um, I think I've answered that question. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, Dr. Cromie. Yeah, very fully. Thank you. And I, and I think it's important that um, you brought up, I think um, you and Dr. Turner both spoke about um, student loan debt. Um, but I think there's one thing to forget give it, which is putting a Band-Aid on the problem, we have to address the underlying issue, which is borrowing. And if we're talking about a particular population, we have to think outside the box around different ways to fund that. There's Pell Grant money, there's other money, but these individuals shouldn't be getting into debt to begin with when they're managing so many different um, issues. And that sort of takes me over to the question about poverty and how that really um, impacts diverse student populations whether it's first-gen students, um, those that are working parents that we spoke about, and then um, how, how, how can personal values and priorities influence the way students perceive and manage their time in college? So it depends on what you've grown up with and what, what culture you've grown up with. Uh, you know, one of the things that really struck me, I think, um, um, uh, Claire mentioned what uh, you know was this persistence. There, there is this, and it comes from our um, uh, our data as well. Um, but that point about if I could take more classes, I would. Right? There is a desire among this population to to go forward and um, uh, you know face all odds and figure out how to move forward and address all of this. But um, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Claire, to talk about just poverty um, and the fact that you've got no one in your family who likely has gone on for any type of post-secondary education and how that also impacts um, access to resources and knowledge and getting that information from a time poverty perspective as well. Yeah, so I think there are a number of sort of important points there. And so I'll try to, to talk about them in a, in a little bit of order, I guess. I think, um, we talked a lot structurally about financial issues. And so I think one of the important things for us to think about as a society generally, but also individual institutions is there are a lot of um, unspoken assumptions that I think go into not just how we offer financial aid, for example, but how we talk about it and how we share information about it. So if you look at something really simple and just look at the federal financial aid process, how do students get federal aid? There's sort of a lot of barriers along the way. Part of them are informational. So um, there was a study done a few years ago uh, by the U.S. federal government where it looked at the websites of institutions and it showed that that almost none of them even mentioned that you can have child care included in your financial aid. And when we when we know that already nationally, at least a quarter of students have kids, that's really kind of shocking that it would be treated as such an unusual thing. And if you even look at 
at the, the federal financial aid handbook, it calls childcare an, an unusual expense. It, it categorizes it already as non-normative. Um, and so I think some of those subtle distinctions actually have a big impact because they send messages to students that they don't belong in college, but they also make it very hard for them to find the information they need to get the financial aid that they need. Um, and there are various things we could do to change that. We could change the way we talk about them, but we could also just add a question to the FAFSA about the age and number of a student's children and then automatically include child care calculations on financial aid. You know, we have national data on what child care costs. We know how many hours in which the student is enrolled. This could all be done automatically at some level, but we don't do it. And I think that reflects um, our assumptions about who it is that current students are that we don't even realize we're probably making when we build a lot of these structures and systems. And so I think that's a good example that points to how we need to sort of systematically look at these structures and think about what assumptions are we making and how can we change them. And so there are a lot of those simple changes we could make to financial aid, for example, automatically including child care. But there are also other assumptions. For example, we don't include the living expenses of a, of, a, of a student's dependents in their financial aid formula because it's not considered a cost of going to college. But what that overlooks is there is a time cost. So a student who has kids and has to feed them and give them health care and put a roof over their heads has to then work in order to pay for those expenses. And that takes time directly away from the time that they can spend enrolled in classes. So we as a society are making a decision that that's not a true cost of college. But if you start to think about time costs, you realize it is, in fact, a cost for attending college. And so we could make a decision to include some or all of those costs in financial aid calculations, for example. Um, but above and beyond all these changes, we currently don't fund everybody's financial need. So even if we fixed our calculations of financial aid, financial need and made them more accurate for modern students, we'd still run into the problem that they, they still wouldn't get enough money to cover all of their need on average. And so that's something we need to think about as a culture as well. Are we giving a lot of students enough money to enroll in college, but not to actually complete college because they don't have the resources they need to actually dedicate the time to actually complete the classes and complete the degrees. Um, in terms of the individual students, I think what one narrative that's often not told that we've seen in some of our longer term qualitative research, um, we have a study right now that we have not yet published, but we're about to send off for review, where we interviewed a lot of students in depth, and we followed up what happened to a bunch of these students later. And it was really interesting that most of the students did graduate with a four year degree, but it was often after eight years, after 12 years after a lot of things that took a really long time, often with good GPAs, but the cost to that student of taking that long to finish a degree is an incredible personal cost. It's not just eight years of lost potential income after you've earned your degree. It's also the cost of going to school for all eight years or 12 years in a state of incredibly high stress and time poverty, because the entire time they're attending school, they're kind of working two jobs, as it were. Their job as a student, and then their job as a parent, their job as a worker, their job as a caretaker of other people in their family. And so I think that's something else that's not talked about. There's often a deficit narrative of students not managing their time or not prioritizing school, but often it's the opposite. These are students who are really prioritizing school despite persistent challenges and are succeeding at high cost to themselves with little supports. And so I think we need to shift that narrative and really talk about it in those terms to understand both how we can better serve the students, but also what we're kind of losing as a society when we don't better support these people, where these, these are people who are highly productive and highly competent and care about what they're doing. And, and if we could help more of them to finish degrees sooner, it would actually be a benefit to society as a whole, um, in addition to the benefits that these students and their families would see. Thank you, Claire. That's great. I have a follow-up question, but I want to allow uh, Dr. Turner to jump in here as well and to comment on what she's seeing from her perspective. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we also, so kind of bringing it back to Black single mother students, um, this one, a really important thing to keep in mind about poverty and social class issues is that they are intersectional. And so we know that race and class um, make a huge difference in terms of who experiences poverty. And we found that in um, our student debt survey that three fourths of black single mother students say that they cannot come up with $2,000 within the next month. And so a lot of times that's one thing that student parents need is they need emergency cash assistance. It's not always, yes, you know, borrowing, as you said, Dr. Cromie is an issue and they need more financial aid generally. But a lot of times it's coming up with cash for just basic everyday necessities. Um, and so um, emergency cash assistance is one thing that um, policymakers could do to help this issue. Um, also, 
it's difficult sometimes for student parents to qualify for public assistance. So things like temporary assistance for needy families, which have certain work requirements that student parents may not always meet. And so um, being flexible about those work requirements or figuring out a way for student parents to actually be able to be eligible for those things without meeting specific work requirements would be um, another thing that policymakers could do. Um, so definitely looking into public assistance programs, things like um, housing choice vouchers, and like I said, TANF and so forth um, would be another way to alleviate this policy issue because Black single mother students especially are more likely to be in poverty, single mothers generally. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Thank you. So I'm going to bring um, Linda back into the conversation and thinking about the structural issues that um, Claire and Jennifer spoke about. So, you know, there's childcare and its availability. So if you're taking one or two courses, this is one of the things I think we've seen in Texas. I don't know if it's everywhere, um, is that when you sign up for childcare, you have to pay for it by the week or the month or something. And it's so many hours. What if you just need it for two hours every two days, right? So to take a class. So there's the availability of that. There's um, institutions making sure that there are office hours or resources that accommodate working folks, right? As opposed to the traditional student. That can be another big barrier. Um, and then thinking about it more broadly around, it's not just the folks in administrative office, but professors. So someone's late with a paper or late with something, there needs to be some um, recognition of um, what other pressures are on these students that um, it's not because they were out partying last night, right? It was because they had a sick kid and they were working and all of these other things and just thinking about the whole educational process differently. So I'm going to bring you in, Linda, because I know that some of the work that you do at WGU, but I also know that you're aware of what number of your colleagues are doing in this space as well. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Thank you. Um... I first want to go back to the structural issues of financial aid really quickly, because uh, we believe that we need to modernize the financial aid model to better serve adult learners um, and, and working learners. And we feel the financial model, financial aid model that exists today at the federal and at the state level was really built for uh, 18 to 25 year olds um, with the assumption that they are receiving support from their parents, that they are learning exclusively in person environments um, and that don't, they don't experience the day to day uh, financial stress that older students are facing that we've been talking about today. So uh, we definitely need more of um, a retreat uh, from the semester credit hour. Uh, basis for financial aid to include competency-based education, to include online learning, to so that it incentivizes institutions to think more flexibly about offering um, instruction, when to offer it, where to in offer it, so that it is much more centered on the student's needs as opposed to these systemic um, um, sy these systemic structures that w have been in place for hundreds of years. Um, so in that respect, obviously uh, WGU, we are one of the most, if not the most student centric uh, university in, in the country and globally. Um, we have uh, a lot of uh, faculty and online resources that offer tools to help our students um, balance their school work and their family life. I, what I love most about WGU is that we embed uh, social emotional learning to in everything that we do to enable student success and overall well-being. And again, this includes anywhere from, you know, providing the appropriate tools and processes, um, integrating learning experiences to develop individual and organizational, emotional, social, and cultural intelligence. So we have uh, a wide array of student well-being services, mental health support to help our students navigate the personal, family, financial challenges that will essentially impact their academic success. Um, 
What we like to say differentiates WGU from other institutions, it's not that we're online, it's not that we're competency-based, it's that we have program mentors who are faculty who support our students. They provide that one-on-one support uh, from the day that the student enrolls at WGU through their academic journey to completion. So our faculty, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our faculty model as well, because it is disaggregated into different roles. We have faculty who serve as the program mentors. They help our students navigate the day to day. They check in on our students regularly to ensure that they're logging in and making progress towards their degree plan. Um, they act as their cheerleader. They become so bonded and so uh, knowledgeable of the well-being of, of their students. Um, and they use technology to help them keep track of the many students that they're assigned to. And so inna- uh, technology enables us to do this more personalized learning, one-on-one support in a scalable way. Uh, so the other type of faculty that we have are the instructors and our instructors are there. They they are um, um, experts in their field. Uh, they are able to answer questions from students. Um, they are available pretty much 24 uh, seven as students are, are working on their coursework late at night after they've put their kids to bed uh, and they have questions that may rise up um, as they're going through the content, they can ping uh, a faculty member to help them you know, through uh, the difficulty that they're having. Um, we also have instructor uh, faculty who do the evaluation. So they are far removed from the student in terms of uh, really reducing that subjectivity or bias um, and uh, maintaining the integrity of uh, the assessment because uh, it's very important in an online competency-based learning environment to ensure the integrity of, of the learning process. But I, I think I answered your question, uh, Deborah, but sometimes I go off on tangents, tangents, so I apologize. No, no, no. And I think it's so great to have you here representing WGU because I think that you are in many ways a model for how things should work. Um, and, I, and with that, I want to turn back to Claire. I mean, you talked about, Claire, some research and work you've done with the City U- University of New York. And I'm just curious um, if you can share, uh, to the extent that you're aware, as to what they're doing with that data and what challenges they're facing to to institute support services for these particular populations that you have identified. I mean, I think it's a it's a long process with a lot of steps, and so I think um, sometimes there are research challenges. For example, a CUNY would love to offer childcare to all students who want to have it, but they're very limited with resources. And so our childcare centers, you know, they did go and get some external, some extra funding from the city in, in places that did help us to increase it a bit, but it's still far below what we need it to be if we really want it to be available for every student who needs it, for example. Um, I think it's been really helpful, for example, give, talking to with these issues about even just faculty in their classes, because you can start to have some really interesting conversations where, where faculty members who teach these students are aware of these issues, but they're not always aware of some of the nuances. And so I will have faculty members come up to me and go, yes, I've totally seen this with my students, but I'd never thought about, you know, and then we talk about something like um, uh, I forget who mentioned it, but someone said something about uh, dis- decisions about deadlines or when students run into issues. And one of the things we found in our research, for example, is you'll interview one student and they'll have had a number of things happen that may have caused some, some not even necessarily delay, but maybe a little more difficulty performing academically at the level they would like in a particular course. And in some instances, for example, if it's something that's recognized as sort of a normal excuse, like a, a parent dies or they have the flu, then they feel comfortable going to the professor and saying, oh, you know, this is what's going on and the professor is very understanding. But interestingly, I don't think any of the students we interviewed ever talked about going to the professor because of other challenges they face. They tend to see it as their own personal responsibility. So issues with childcare, issues with work, you know, things that were considered sort of non-standard. And so for example, something really simple a professor can do is we can look at our own syllabi 
20 years ago when I'd write a syllabus, I would say, oh, here's the rules for excused absences and here's what to do. For example, if there's a death in the family or an illness, here's what you do. And I realized with my own research, I'm going, well, I should I should probably not just say death in the family or illness because it's setting a norm for what's allowed. I should mention a wider variety of things. And so I started to do that. And that's a simple change that I think people can make when they're aware of it. So individual instructors or even institutions can make instructors aware that these are some some legitimate reasons that students might have where they might actually need to be told that it's acceptable to discuss these issues with faculty members, because many faculty members are happy to give an extension, but the student may not even feel comfortable going to them because they may not realize it would be considered an acceptable reason. Um, so I, it's an interesting question because I think there are very large changes that require action at the federal level. There are very small changes that individual instructors can do. And then there are these medium level changes that can happen at the institutional level that are impacted by both of those things. Um, for example, CUNY over the last, I think, decade roughly has increased a lot of these one stop services for students, which I think was a is a really important thing. Um, because large public universities often have a lot of bureaucracy and different offices that do different things, and students who are time poor are going to be the most negatively impacted by being told, oh, go wait in the line in the bursar's office, and then when you're there, go over here to the financial aid office, and then when you're done with that, go over there to the advisor's office. They may not have time to physically do that. And so things like these one-stop services are where we're ma making an attempt to figure out how to get students the, the services they need in a more, more efficient way is really important. I think also with COVID, there was a lot of push to put things online. And, the, and, and I think that made institutions realize that a lot could be done online, that they hadn't fully appreciated and could be done online before. And then we've maintained a lot of those services online. And I think that's really important for students with time poverty as well, because time poverty isn't necessarily always even just the amount of time. It can also be the flexibility of time. When can a student do something? Where are they able to do it? For, and so having flexible online options at various hours really can make a big difference. Difference if student student can talk to the financial aid office or the bursar's office or an advisor or a tutoring center at these various times in these more flexible ways, that also helps them to manage the time that they have in in ways that are that are much easier than if they have to physically show up at a specific place at a specific time. No, that's great. And I'm going to bring it back over to Jennifer because this circles it back to a comment that you made early on, Jennifer, around resources being available, whether it's TANF or whatever it might be. And it goes back to the underlying issue of how do students even know that these programs exist, um, especially if they're first gen um, or are not familiar with all of the social supports that are out there. So I have two parts of this question for you, Jennifer. You know, one is what are you seeing as, um, uh, you know, policy change? Changes that need to be made and what data is needed to help support the need for those changes. So um, uh, Claire was just talking about some of the research that she does. And I know whether you're going to state legislature or federal legislature, they want to know where's the data that backs up that this will have an impact. Yeah, so um, I just want to echo um, something that um, Claire said in terms of resources um, being brought online. I know for our, in our research on Black single mother community college students, they mentioned online tutoring um, was something that was really, really helpful for them in terms of um, actually being able to work around their own schedules and things like that. Um, and then I just want to make sure I'm understanding the last part of your question. Mm -hmm. um, so you're asking about policies, but are you asking about policies for support services or just like policies in general. In general, so anything that would help this population, um, you know, be able to more easily manage and move forward. It might decrease. It's. I don't think there's anything that's going to eliminate the time poverty issue for this particular right. population, right? But okay. might be able to ease the process. Or if there's data that would help change policy in a way, you know, some of the things we were talking about earlier that could be changed around um, the FAFSA. I think Claire mentioned, you know, just changing, you know, a couple of simple questions could make a huge difference for folks, right? Yeah, so I think um, one of the, so a couple of the things we talk about in our research in terms of policies is, so um, Claire mentioned childcare and how it's not necessarily feasible for, colleges to provide like drop-in childcare, for example, or even on-campus childcare in some cases. Um, one of the things that we talk about is potentially um, community colleges, especially collaborating with Head Start 
um, to try to make childcare more accessible and affordable for student parents. Um, another thing that um, we recommend is colleges par partnering with state and local housing authorities. So especially with the housing choice uh, vouchers um, to provide affordable housing. So it really becomes like a basic needs conversation too, like I said at the beginning. Um, and one example of this is Ohio State University's Access Collaborative and how they partner with Columbus Scholar House, which is an organization that provides affordable housing for low income students, student parents. Um, but it really goes back to knowing who your student population is. So collecting data on them, actually talking to them and getting to know them and not making assumptions like Dr. Claire said about who those, those students are, like really getting to know your students and understanding what they need. So um, there have been more attempts recently to collect data on student parents. Um, certain states have implemented bills to do that, um, but that, that needs to happen across the board so that colleges actually know who their, what their student population looks like and doesn't just make assumptions about who those students are and what they need. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And it'll allow me to do a little plug for our student financial wellness <laughs> survey that we do every year. Um, and we survey uh, students at colleges and universities across the country around, um, uh, you know, how they approach financial aid, um, uh, financial insecurity, food insecurity, housing, transportation, child care. We break it out based on single moms, et cetera. We report it back um, at the institution level, at the system level, at the state level, and at the national level. And I can say the last couple of years, we have um, uh, hosted a basic needs summits uh, as a result of the institutions that participate in that and have asked institutions to share <coughs> Some of the best practices or mitigations they've put in place as a result of the data they found. Um, and I think that's where you're going, Jennifer, is to, and I think uh, as what Claire was talking about is knowing your students and what they're facing. So, for example, one of them was uh, one of the questions for one campus was um, whether or not there was a food pantry on campus. And, you know, 40% said there is not, there is a food pantry. So it's about awareness. And so it circled them back to thinking about um, uh, every single student that comes into their institution has to go through a meeting with this office, an in-person meeting where they sit down and they explain all of the resources that are available, including Claire, to your point, you know, if you're a single mom and you have a child, sick child, it's okay to go and talk to your professor about this. Um, and then they resurvey to see what is the impact. Now, you have to realize there's always a new group of students moving through. So you never completely, you have to continue to iterate and find additional solutions to, to resolve that. But I think your points are incredibly well taken. Um, I know uh, we're at quarter up, so I wanted to create an opportunity. I know, Andrea, we usually open it up and see if there are any questions from those who are participating either via the chat or um, raising their hand. And I'm not seeing any, Andrea, unless you've seen something. No, not at this time. Okay, that's okay. I have more to go, so it's all good. Um, so I want to then talk about um, this transformation. So one of the things we were talking about uh, when we were preparing um, a little bit earlier is this population um, that is juggling so many things, um, whether they're a single mom or they're taking care of um, adults or other dependents um, or doing all three and working full time and trying to go to school full time, man, oh man, Linda, this is a set of you know skills that um, we need to capture from a competency perspective, right? They're able to juggle multiple priorities. They're able to meet deadlines. I mean, uh, they figured out how to negotiate various pieces, uh, how to work in a collaborative fashion, right? Um, so uh, I, I'm gonna turn to you, Linda, to just comment on, you know, as you think about all those pieces, not only do they make them, you know, better students, but I would expect that employers would love to have people who have already developed all these types of skills. Absolutely. Um, and as a matter of fact, we embed um, those skills in all of our courses, all of our degree programs. We work with business and industry to ensure that we are embedding the relevant um, competencies so that when our students graduate, they are workplace ready. 
Um, but yeah, modern learners um, at WGU, they're, ga- they're gaining a wide range of those transferable skills that will enhance and do enhance their employability and effectiveness. Um, what we do every year is we do a, a Harris poll of our employers who hire our graduates. And they have very high satisfaction rates of our graduates, uh, oftentimes coming in at 98% of extremely satisfied or highly satisfied um, employers with our graduates who say they will hire uh, WGU graduates in the future. Um, So we're really proud of uh, those results. And, um, you know, if you think about uh, self-directed learning with support from our program mentors, that really sense that really creates a sense of responsibility and um, gaining knowledge, pursuit, pursuing knowledge independently. And that in itself is a great uh, marketable skill. Uh, Think about digital literacy being in an online university and developing the proficiency in various digital tools and platforms. Um, There's a lot of opportunity for problem solving and critical thinking and adapting to diverse learning environments um, beyond the traditional uh, learning environment. So yeah, there's there's a lot involved, um, time management skills, communication skills. Anyway, I could go on and on. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's exciting. It, it is. It, you know, it's funny, um, you know, in talking about all of those durable skills, I, I just had breakfast this morning with Tim Taylor from America Succeeds, who um, has developed a, really a curriculum for durable skills. And he was sharing with me, and please let me be a little off on the statistics, but um, in talking to folks that uh, were training plumbers, they said, or welders, give me your worst welder. If they have durable skills, I can train them on welding. But the piece that I really need are all of those durable skills, um, which I think is something that is changing dramatically as we move forward, right, in terms of needs of employers. Um, I wanted to go back to something that Claire spoke about, which is sort of the time to graduation, this sort of you know, eight to 12 years to be able to manage everything and, um, you know, and to get through and to finish, you know, the persistence uh, is just unbelievable and um, to be applauded. And, you know, I think back to how we measure the success of an institution. um, And I know Linda knows this well, you know, it's how many graduate in four years, how many graduate in six years. But Linda, I don't know that anybody pays attention beyond six years, right? Um, and, And measures that. Or, or the fact that um, an individual might um, transfer based on various factors in their lives from one institution to another. And I'm sure at WGU, you also get folks that come in with some um, credits from other institutions. And how we think about um, measuring, measuring success of this population, going back to Claire's comment about how much is lost. So I think about the opportunity costs associated with it taking eight to 12 years, but without some other solution in place to address a number of these um, issues that we've identified, I don't know that there's um, uh, something that will happen in the interim, but what about, um, and I don't know if you do something different at WGU or when you think about sort of the time to graduation? So we we track two-year, four-year, and six-year graduation. Yeah. And we're a little bit different because the majority of our students um, are do have some college credit, uh, but no degree. And the way that the feds calculate like six-year graduation rates, they're looking at first-time, full-time students who start right. with a cohort, and then they they um, calculate out how many years it took them to graduate. I remember when I was at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and we would we would calculate graduation rates to include students who may have started at a university uh, or who started at a community college and then ended up graduating at a university. And we we counted that as a um, part of that cohort and gave both the community college and the university credit for that student. Uh, in terms of a success. And so <clears> at <throat> WGU, our graduation rates look a little different because we don't fit that definition, but we do track our own. So we still have 
a long ways to go um, in terms of improving our completion rate. So we have uh, at the undergraduate level, 53% of our students who are completing in six year, in four years, sorry. Um, and so we, we still have a long ways to go to, to increase that. And that's why we're hyper-focused on um, not only the learning experience uh, for each of our learners, but ensuring their success because we're not so much focused on enrollment um, but we are very much in fo focused on the student experience and their success rates. Um, so we're implementing a lot of inno innovation and a lot of intervention when we look at the data. We were talking earlier about the importance of um, data being data driven, being data enabled. Um, WGU is very, very much uh, data driven and data enabled. And so we look at uh, key performance indicators. Um, and when we start to see that we're not doing, we're not getting the results that we want, then we begin to change course and we put in new interventions. Um, and our faculty are uh, really the pulse of uh, our students and they're able to communicate upward, you know, this is what we need. This is how we need to change it. This is a friction point for uh, certain students, um, for certain underserved populations. Um, and so that's what I love about WGU because we're constantly changing how we um, provide those support services and uh, using those alert systems to let us know this isn't working for this particular student. We got to make a change. We've got to pivot. Um, and and that's that's what I think is will help. Uh, you know, on average, our students who come to WGU, they're getting their uh, undergraduate degree in two and a half years. Um, and so time degree is time to degree is important because uh, <laughs> ultimately it's going to save you time and money. Right, exactly. I'm I'm going to jump to, uh, I had a follow-up question for Claire, but I'm going to jump to a question that came in from uh, one of our participants. Uh, the question is, I'm curious what type of career advising students at CUNY or WGU receive to ensure they are pursuing a degree that will lead to a, a high-wage job? And I would add to not only high-wage job, but an in-demand job. Um, and I'll, I'll go to Claire first, and then we'll circle back to you, Linda. I don't know, Claire, if you're aware of what's what's done in that space. I mean, CUNY is a huge university, so it's very variable. And so students get lots of different advising from different people at different times. Um, but I think it's a critical point. I, I think in these large institutions where there's an advising office that is not necessarily specialized in a particular career field, which is where a lot of students initially go for advising, they can get advice that's not in their best interest with the best of intentions, but advisors aren't necessarily experts. For example, I'm in the math department. We've seen students come in to be a math major who were advised to take courses that were not at the, at the higher level that they were prepared for because of, of the advising department, the person who advised them maybe not necessarily being aware of what was going on there. And so I think there are a lot of concerted efforts to advise students well, but it's a huge challenge for a really large in institution like CUNY to reach all of those students at the right time. Um, and so I think what, that is a factor with students who are time poor, that there are definitely students who are taking courses that are perhaps non-optimal that lengthen their time to degree. And I, I don't have statistics on how I'm actually a different research project where we're trying to measure that uh, quantitatively, but we don't have final results yet. But just from my own observations on the ground, I would suspect there's, there is a significant proportion of students where that happens to them. And we need to give institutions better information about how to, how to address that. Um, because I think particularly for students, this often happens for students who are transferring from one place to another, or they've emigrated from another country, or they went to a university for a couple of years, and then they left, and then they got a job, and they had kids, and now they're coming back, and what happens, what do you do with, the, say, the math courses they took before? What do you recommend that they do next? And I think a lot of our current advising systems, while we're aware of many of these issues, we don't necessarily have a robust a set of research results that tell us exactly what we should be doing in these situations to support students, because a lot of our assumptions are based on these more you know, traditional models of who students are when they come into the university. And so I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And I, so I think CUNY has, has taken a lot of steps to try to improve that, but it's really challenging. It's a challenging thing to do well, but it's something we have to learn to do well if we're really going to support these students. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm assuming, Linda, if you can give a very short answer, my gut says you are doing this work at WGU. Yes, I mean, we only offer uh, degree programs in the high demand fields where there are jobs and good paying jobs. So we have business, IT, um, healthcare, which includes nursing and our education. So uh, we, we, and we only offer bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, so we wanna make sure that our students are going into a field that does have job demands and good paying jobs. Great. So I'm going to, we're coming up on time. I, I have still a list of questions, but I'm going to ask one sort of lightning round question. If you could, you have a choice between one policy you could change or one mm-hmm. additional piece of research data you would want to see, what would it be? And I'm going to start with Dr. Turner since she hasn't spoken in a couple of minutes. That's a really hard question. <laughs> Don't think you have to pick um, one, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, one policy change or one piece of research data. Um, just off the top of my head, um, I guess because you know we were talking a lot about basic needs and finances. Um, it would have to be something related to either making college more affordable or relieving student debt but like I'm also thinking about what you said Dr. Cromie about borrowing being the real issue so so yeah I don't necessarily have a policy like a concrete one but um but that's something that comes to my mind just like something to alleviate the financial burden yeah right well thank you you've given our other two panelists a chance to think so thank you for that (laughs) I'll go to Claire next Um, that's a very challenging question. I mean, I would say p- simplest, but pie in the sky answer would be increased financial aid until we've met everybody's financial need. That would that would make the biggest difference. Um, and while I expect we as a country are not immediately prepared to do that as a second choice, it would be just go and look at the financial aid policies and modify them to reflect the realities of the students who are currently attending college. There are a lot of minor tweaks we could make that would make a huge difference and at least better reflecting student need. Um, which might help us and advocate for more funding to make it clear what those needs are. That's great. Thank you. And Linda? Well, that was going to be mine. I was just re-overhaul financial aid. Um, But I think going back to the semester credit hour, which really dictates um, when and how long uh, a student, you know, needs to be in a a classroom to demonstrate uh, learning. Um, And I think learning should be um, not measured by seat time, but more by competency. And so that that would be, I think the semester credit hour seems to be the linchpin of uh, prohibiting institutions from really innovating in the way that they should be to expand access and success for all students, regardless of their background. Great. Well, I'm going to share one my, my one policy change, which would be to integrate, whether it's apprenticeships or internship or work more into the educational experience so that somebody doesn't have to work outside of what they're studying, but they're getting paid and it has to be paid. They're getting paid, so that takes care of that piece of it, but they're also starting to get some work experience in the field in which they're planning to uh, practice going forward. Um, that would be mine. We, I think we need to take you know, the federal aid program and WIOA and mash them together and use that money in a whole new different type of way. Um, And that's a conversation for another time. Uh, This hour has flown by. Claire, Jennifer, Linda, I can't thank you enough. What a great conversation and discussion. Um, I appreciate your time today in sharing your knowledge and expertise and thoughts in this space. Um, I know I enjoyed it and I'm sure our audience does as well. Andrea, thank you for all you've done. Andrea has dropped a note in the chat about uh, where you can look for future uh, events. um, And I hope you'll join us Um, again. Thank you, Jennifer, Claire, Linda, and Andrea. This was fabulous. Thank you so much.